This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Friday the 13th is often thought to be a bad day. For Nancy McKay, in 2009, it was a really bad day. It ended with a bang. Fortunately, the gun she was holding didn't end her life. But then, in 2015, a cancer diagnosis took her hair, but it gave her inner strength. Nancy's experiences with alcohol and cancer coupled with training as a coach, allows her to help others become empowered through her business, Amazing Outlook. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Lucy. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Nice. Now, I know, I know this is an incredibly hard story to share, but I think it's a very important story to share, especially in the times that we find ourselves in with um, alcoholism, mental health crisis, everything is, you know, I feel it's just coming to a point. I think the more that we can help other people understand that they're not alone and that there's other people that have been in this place, then, you know, perhaps we can help more people. I agree. I agree. And that's why I'm so transparent about my story is, you know, just hoping that I'll be able to help others. You know, that's, uh, not feel so alone. So um, that's why I share it. So what brought you to that, that point on that Friday? What was going on in your life that everything just piled up on you and, and you were ready to tap out? Well, my father had committed suicide two years prior. Um, March of 2007. And that sent me on a um, spiral, a guilt spiral and uh, a drinking spiral. (laughs) And so I just, I felt horribly guilty. I felt like I should have been there for him. I should have, you know, I just felt horribly guilty. And so my drinking just picked up exponentially. I had been abusing alcohol for years, but I I hadn't hit that alcoholic line in the sand yet. (laughs) And the guilt that I felt over my dad's death helped me cross that line. And so um, I found myself, uh, you know, drinking to excess every day, Uh, I would wake up with a hangover, a horrible hangover every day. And it got to the point where my hands were shaking so bad that I couldn't put my eyeliner on in the morning. And I knew I, you know, I would look at myself in the mirror and I would say, you have got a problem and you need to do something about it. But at the time, I was not able to find anything that would helped me con- concretely other than the traditional um, 12 step program or rehab, something like that. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready to go down that, <laughs> that line yet. Um, I couldn't afford a rehab and AA just seemed so demoralizing to me. It, it just felt like, um, It, it just felt I like- mean, for, for me, one of the, one of the things that, I mean, I've never really been to an AA meeting, but one of the things that always calls into question for me is that, you know, people always start off by telling their story by stating that they're an alcoholic. And for me, you may have an alcohol problem, but you're not an, you're not your alcohol problem. Right. And, and, that, and, and for me, that's always caused a bit of a, 
and yeah. uncertainty, a disconnect. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a very common opinion. And it's one that is becoming maybe even more so. I'm not quite sure. But I do know that I wasn't ready to go down that road yet. And on Friday the 13th, I was going through um, kind of like a mental breakdown. You know, I, I was, I knew something was happening to me that day, that I was just I was agitated, I was emotional, it was just, it was, you know, a weird day. And um, we were meeting friends for happy hour that night. And we, I finished off the little bit of Chardonnay that was left in the bottle, which was rare that anything was left in the bottle, number one, um, <laughs> before we went to the bar and went to the bar and, you know, we were there for a couple, three hours, had some clam chowder and, you know, I thought everything was fine and we got up to leave and I staggered out the door. I hadn't had that much to drink. And that was part of the problem was things were becoming unpredictable. The amount of alcohol that I could consume varied, you know, on a, almost on a daily basis, I couldn't depend on my body's reaction to it anymore. So we get home and I said to my husband, oh my God, we didn't stop at the liquor store. We have no more wine. And he said, I think you've had enough. And those five little words sent me into a tailspin. Um, I got really angry at first. And then, you know, and I stormed off to the bedroom and slammed the door and, you know, all kinds of drama. And, and then I started having an incredible pity party for myself and which rolled into, I'm a burden, everyone would be better off without me. And so all of this took place and probably, you know, that emotional slide I took about 10 minutes and, you know, maybe 30. I don't, I, I don't remember exactly, but it wasn't very long, you know, and I decided that the best thing to do would be to shoot myself. So I got out of bed and I went around to my husband's nightstand and I pulled the 357 out of the drawer and I put it to my head and it didn't fire. And I thought, what the hell is going on? You know, what's the problem? So I put the gun, you know, I held it down and I looked at it and I, <laughs> I mean, this is how, how stupid it was. I almost called my husband in to say, what the hell's wrong with this gun? Why won't it fire? I mean, not thinking straight, right? Then I realized that the safety was on. And as soon as I released the safety, it fired. And thank God it wasn't pointing at my head. <laughs> so, you know, I say in my story, the only thing that got shot was an innocent pillow on the bed. And, um, you know, my husband came running and all hell broke loose and, and that took care of my drinking career. <laughs> that was it. That was the last time I um, was was drunk. And my neighbor who was in AA, um, I called her the next day and asked for help. She took me to an AA meeting the next day after that. And I was, um, and AA saved my life. You know, <laughs> I didn't think I was that bad. You know, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. But what I went through with them saved me. And the tools that I learned in recovery helped, helped me deal with the changes that came 
was six years later when I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Do you think that you're, you know, when you look back now and your original relationship with alcohol, was that because it, I've heard some people say that it's not necessarily a drinking problem, it's a thinking problem. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. It, and everything begins with our thoughts. It's not the alcohol that's causing our problems. It's our thoughts about the alcohol, or it's not our life that's causing our problems. It's our thoughts about our life that's causing our problems. So if we convince ourselves that uh, we can't have a good time without alcohol or that our life sucks and drinking is the only escape we have or, you know, any, any, <laughs> you know, an infinite amount of thoughts about why, why we do what we do, why we use outside things to, to cope with internal dis-ease, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, when, when we are looking outside for things to solve our problems instead of looking within, that's when we have a problem. And I, and I don't care if it's alcohol or drugs or gambling or Netflix, you know, if we're using something else to cope with our unhappiness, then we're not, you know, we're not living an authentic life. It's that masking. It's, it's the numbing. It's the pushing exactly. down whatever the problem is and pretending it's not there. Right. And not only, so not only do I, do we numb ourselves to our problems and the negative side, but we are also numbing ourselves to the good stuff. Right. So you know, when, if we're, you know, let's pretend we're at a wedding, right? And we're, everybody's toasting with champagne and everything is wonderful. And you have two or three glasses too many, right? Then not only are you putting a veil over, you know, your thoughts about, well, I have to go to work tomorrow and I really don't like my job and let's have another drink so I don't have to think about it. But you're also missing the beauty of the present moment and the enjoyment and living your life mindfully and, and presently, right? So yeah, it can take the edge off and, and that's why I liked it. You know, it was that, that first sip that gave you the, ah, everything's going to be okay, <laughs> right? Everything's yeah. right with the world. And then what happened was, and this is when I, I, and I didn't understand it at the time, but after I got into recovery, I understood what this was. I felt this itch in my solar plexus. That's how I describe it. That the only thing that would make that go away was another sip. And what I found out was that's called the phenomenon of craving. And it can affect you in your body in, in a variety of places. But it's like, you feel like you have a hole. Like you're, you're the, the hole in the donut sort of thing, you know? And, it, and for me, it was this itch. And the only thing that would fix it would be another sip. And that's why alcoholics or people who have alcohol use disorder have a hard time quitting is because they're trying to fill up that hole or, or get rid of that itch. And that's the only way they know how to do it. Is the itch the symptom or the root cause? No, I think it's a symptom. I think it's a symptom because the root cause, you know, God knows where that came from, you know, but it is a thought. So it's, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be happy. I'm not worthy. I'm a loser. You know, there's something going on there that is creating negative and toxic beliefs in your mind. 
And so when you believe something like that, then it creates an emotion, right? If you feel like I'm not enough or I'm not good enough, then it creates this feeling of desperation and increase, you know, just really horrible disappointment in yourself and, and, you know, a variety of negative feeling. And so then when you have these negative feelings, you're going to take action that's not necessarily positive, right? I'm going to pour in a, you know, have another drink or look at my phone and scroll the games or, you know, whatever it may be. And it may be, it may seem like benign behavior, but if you're doing it from a place of having negative emotions and it helps you not feel them, then that's where the addiction can come in. That's where the addiction kicks in. And then, you know, your result is you, you're drunk or you're, um, you're not present with your family because you're addicted to your phone or to Netflix or your, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But so the thought, the thought creates a feeling and that creates, that forces you to take action or not take action, you know? So it's either I'm going to get help or I'm not going to get help, <laughs> right? And it's just, it's a, it's a cycle that can only be changed if you change your thoughts about it. So instead of, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, it might be a leap to go, well, I'm the, <laughs> I'm all that in a bag of chips, right? So, you know, maybe it's, I'm good enough at something or I'm good enough for the job I currently have or, you know, something like that. So you lift it up just 1%. If you can just shift 1%, then that changes the trajectory of everything. So then that leveling up of the thought will level up your emotion. Okay, well, maybe I'm not so bad. You know, maybe that gives you hope. And then if you feel hopeful, what actions do you take or not take? Well, you know, if you feel hopeful, maybe you'll pick up a book that's going to shed some light on what you're going through. Or maybe you're going to talk to somebody and ask for help. And it's in that asking for help. That's the, that's when we have to make ourselves vulnerable. And that can be some of the hardest things to do is to, speaking for myself, asking for help has always been one of the last things I've ever done. Yeah. I've learned over the past few years that I have to ask for help, that it's not. And, and I think that's because, you know, in society, we believe vulnerability is a weakness Right. And asking for help is a weakness when really, you know, being honest and truthful for who you are and what you need, that comes from a place of power. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You can't, I, you know, I believe what Brene Brown says, and that is you cannot be courageous without being vulnerable first. You know, it's, I think it's just absolutely, I believe it's impossible. You know, I think you have to humble yourself and admit that you need help. Everybody needs help in one way or another. And whether it's from another human being or your higher power or your dog, right? Or your cat or your horse, you know, you need, you need connection. We all thrive on connection. And if we are too proud to admit that we are suffering, then, you know, it's, it's a bleak proposition. It you doesn't know? usually end well. No. And, and so then the people who are vulnerable and are willing to ask for help 
and acknowledge that that they're in the middle of the swamp, right? Or in the effing muck, as I like to say, then then that's where the magic happens. Because then you find out how many people love you, how many people are are rooting for you, who are going to support you, who, you know, want you to thrive. And by being vulnerable, you help other people. And that's, you know, my mother used to, to caution me because I wear my heart on my sleeve. And, you know, I used to, you know, it was a criticism. Yeah. Now I think it's a compliment. It is. Yeah. And, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I say it about myself. Um, when I would encounter something that I found emotional, you know, my husband could see something was bothering me and he'd say, you know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine did that for years it's that it's that other f word that we you know we love to use um now i say no no this this situation hurt my heart and i cry yeah because that's how i emotion that's how i release the emotion and i and i say i wear my heart on my sleeve and now he says to me, and that's why I love you. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, when I would say fine, he'd be like, mm, okay. Yeah. But For now you. by being vulnerable, I receive love back. Exactly. Exactly. And you're honoring your authentic self. So when we try to stifle our emotions, when we try to pretend like everything's okay, we are, you know, taking... God knows how many steps backward away from our authentic self. And so, you know, when we try to put up a, a, a you know, put on a good face, right, for, um, you know, stiff upper lip and all that, then we're doing a huge disservice to ourselves, huge disservice. And, you know, the, the, until we can truly embrace ourselves, our, our essential self, and not worry about our social self, you know, and Martha Beck talks about this a lot, the difference between social self and essential self. And it's, you know, society tells us that we're not supposed to wear our heart on our sleeve that we're supposed to, you know, put our, you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and carry on stiff upper lip and don't, you know, don't let what's going on around you affect you. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not a robot and, and stuff affects me. And so, um, and I don't like feeling like crap. So if I feel that way, I know I've got work to do. And if I can't figure it out on my own, then I'm going to ask for help. Because I know that I won't want to sit here in the, you know, as I've heard quoted, the river of misery, if I don't have to. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've learned enough to know that I value my life. I value being a part of this world. And I want to experience and feel at peace as long as I'm here, you know? And that's not going to happen if I try to BS my way through life and pretend like everything's okay when it's not and not have the courage to admit it. There's a soapbox for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
but no, it, it's important for, for anybody that's, you know, stuck in the muck, stuck in the shit to realize that, yeah, I've been, I have been there too. And I just remember having this overwhelming feeling of, I got to run away. I just want to run. I want to go. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Yep. But then you can't. Right. And, and then, so then matter, what? Oh, you know, there you are, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so how have you taken your experiences through, you know, dealing with your relationship with alcohol and your cancer journey? How have you now taken that into helping other people find their power? Well, what happened was when I... Um, was going through treatment for cancer, you know, I realized that life wasn't all that great on the career front. And I started becoming, you know, I worked for a great company and I was making really good money and had wonderful benefits and everything was great, except that I was miserable. And as time came, went on, that, that kind of became my mantra. You know, I didn't get sober and survive cancer to be miserable. And so I decided that something had to change and it was gonna be up to me to do it. And if I wasn't happy in my career, I needed to change something. You know, have you ever gone to the DMV and you know, the people behind the counters are all, they seem to be miserable and you know, and I'd walk out of there going, you know, if you don't like your job, quit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and so I started looking at my, you know, taking my own advice. And about that time, I read a book by Martha Beck that just felt like it was written, especially for me. And then I went to see her at a workshop in California, and then I signed up for her coach training program. And it was life-changing. You know, I, I say frequently that Martha Beck changed my life and she did. Her, her coaching program changed me. The, the way she presents things changed me. Everything changed at that point. And I realized that I could help other people who were at the same place that I was in 2009 and earlier, not have to end up with a gun to their head. You know, if, because what got me there was thinking that, that there was no other alternative to looking at my relationship with alcohol. There was just nothing there. You had to there was no middle ground. You had to go all the way to AA or rehab. And, you know, at the, at the time, I didn't think I was ready for that. So I kept drinking. And so what I like to do, you know, I, I focus on, on women who are struggling with alcohol, who want to explore their relationship with alcohol. But I work with women who are going through anything and, and maybe alcohol isn't their drug of choice, maybe it's Netflix, or maybe it's not a coping tool. Maybe it's just self-confidence and belief in themselves. But I know that if I can get from where I was to where I am now, anybody can. And, you know, so that's, you know, and, and I work on mindset and because everything starts with our thoughts. And so you know, just helping women understand that their thoughts are the, the root of their problem and helping them change them into more positive, powerful thoughts that will become beliefs. And then they'll, then that just automatically, it automatically changes your life because your emotions change and then your actions change. And then your life changes. Nancy, if if somebody is listening and they feel that they're ready to create a change in their life, what's the best way that they can connect with you? Probably visiting my website. Um, AmazingOutlookCoaching.com is probably the best way. And um, 
you know, I would just love to, you know, have a chat with anybody. It's, um, it's my honor to visit with people and, and I love connecting. So I will make sure that all of the links are in the show notes. And Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at the Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by the Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Life is like.